My name is Don Olson, and today we are going to be studying how to explore the Bible, and we are on session seven, and we're going to be talking about living wisely. But before we get started, let's start with the prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come together, read your scriptures, and being in a place that we can read your scriptures, read your word, and be able to open our hearts to you, to find glory and give you glory in all that we do, and pray that you touch each and every one of us each and every day. You help us through our troubles and, our, and guide us in all that we do. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week, Larry was talking about wisdom, and this week we're talking about living wisely. They're very closely related. You know, I'm trying to look them up and figure out if there's a big difference between wisdom and wisely. <laughs> it seems like they kind of fall together there. And in session seven here, we're talking about living wisely. Following God's wisdom leads to joy, while failing to do so leads to grief. But, you know, you stop and think about it. How do you separate wisdom and living wisely? And you really, they kind of coincide with each other in every aspect almost. But what does it mean to live wisely? How do we live wisely? And that's what we're going to try and find out today. And we're going to study and let the Lord lead us, open our hearts to him and let him come in and let the Holy Spirit work in us to help us understand what it means to live wisely. And in Proverbs today, we're going to see if Solomon, did he live wisely in everything he did? Uh, I don't think he was totally wise in everything he did. He, he messed up some too, just like we do. But it starts out here and Proverbs, we start in, it says in Proverbs 14, Solomon used literary device known as kismus. And this term refers to an arrangement of ideas that is then repeated in reverse order. So he's telling you something and then they say it back again, kind of in a reverse order. And the purpose behind this type of literary feature was to repetitive and comparative emphasis. Below is the Chiastic form of Proverbs 14, 8 through 15. It says the prudent and the fools is verses 8. Making amends for sin is verse 9. Secrets of the heart is verses 10. Destruction of wickedness is in verse 11. The way to death is in verse 12. Secrets of the heart is verse 13. Being repaid for sin is in verse 14. And the simple and prudent is verse 15. It says, notice that Solomon began by comparing the prudent with the foolish. He then addresses the subject of cause and effect in regard to the outcomes of foolish living as opposed to wise living. In verse 10, Solomon wanted God's people to understand that wisdom is a matter of the heart. He didn't notice that foolishness always leads to destruction. Then Solomon repeated these themes in reverse order so that God's people would understand the contrast between wise and foolish living. In these verses, Solomon put side by side two very distinct ways of thinking and living. His point was clear. The end of foolishness is destruction, and the end of wisdom is godliness and peace. And when you think about it, it's true. Very, very true in all of that. I mean, if... We open our hearts to the Lord and we let the Lord guide us, then we have wisdom. If we look to the Bible and its context in the Bible and on the contents of the Bible and everything that the Bible teaches us, we gain wisdom in all we do. But if we close our heart and we close the Bible and we don't look to the Lord for anything, we're just being foolish. What happens then? We die. We don't have our just reward to say, which is what? Is it gold and silver like Larry was talking about last week? Is that what we're supposed to get? Gold, silver, money? 
fancy cars, fancy houses. Does a wise man reach for all of that? Or does a wise man really reach into his heart and reach for the Lord? And all that the Lord teaches. Think about that. That is the main thing you want to think about. Does a wise man worry about whether or not his friends talk about what kind of car he drives, what kind of clothes he wears? Or does a wise man worry about what the Lord is thinking about him and what he should be doing to show that he's walking in the way of the Lord? So consider the stark contrast Solomon highlighted between the wise and the foolish in Proverbs 14, 8 through 15. How does a contrast give us a clearer view of two paths? Well, we're going to find out here in just a second. You want to turn the page here. And we're going to get on to prudent. Now, prudent. Now, that's a word we don't hear very often anymore. Somebody who's prude, prudent. The sensible person, it says here in Proverbs 14, 8 through 15. In Proverbs 8, it says, The sensible person's wisdom is to consider his way, but the stupidity of fools deceives them. In verse 15, it says, The inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. Solomon contrasted the wise and the foolish, characterizing the wise as sensible and the foolish as gullible. Some translations use the word prudent. You ever heard somebody be called, oh, that's a, he's a prude or she's a prude or something like that, I think it is. That's a very, very old term. In other words, oh, they don't want to do nothing. They're no fun. You can't have fun with that person. Does that make them a bad person? Makes them cautious. Makes them maybe wise. Makes them maybe smarter than what you are, that's for sure. Some translations use the word prudent. Solomon was urging God's people to be prudent in their thoughts and actions. The word prudent often conjures up notions of being a killjoy, unloving, unconcerned. Too often it is wrongly used with negative connotations. In reality, prudence involves thinking through an opportunity or a challenge carefully before drawing a conclusion and coming to a decision. A person who practices prudence would be referred to as sensible. My wife would say sometimes I'm not very sensible, but I try to be. In verse 15, Solomon contrasted the prudent with the foolish and gullible, the inexperienced. One believes anything but the sensible. One watches his steps. People can easily be enticed by the next new shiny thing that comes along. So the inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. So don't be gullible. Solomon desired for God's people to consider their decision and actions in light of the precepts and principles of God's word. He wanted them to avoid being open to ill-considered fades and false deities. Experience can be a great teacher if coupled with wise counsel of God, but experience without God's wisdom can cause a person to be gullible and spiritually duped by many allurements of the world. The wise person seeks to know, understand, and apply the knowledge of God to every life decision. So when you stop and look at what he's saying, it's okay for us to want to do new and experience new things and understand new things. And there's nothing wrong with that. An inexperienced person, we're all inexperienced to a point. But if we're sensible and we keep our hearts open to the Lord and we watch our steps, it's okay to experience something new because the Lord will keep us on a straight and narrow path. But if we vary off that path, what happens? What happened to Solomon? Did he fall off that path? He had everything everything you could ever want. And he was wiser than any of us will ever be. And he had all the money in the world, and he still fell off that path. When you think about a sensible Christian, who comes to mind? How does that person example help you to be prudent? Is there anyone in your life that you can think of that helps you to be prudent? Is there anyone in your life that keeps you straight and narrow? And if there's not, do you just turn to God? 
And even though there is someone in your life, do you keep God in front of you? What happens when you take your eyes off of him? Do you stay on the straight and narrow or do you fall? Can you walk on water without keeping your eyes on him? Or are you going to sink? Think about that. So as we go on reading here, it says key doctrine. It says the scriptures. The scriptures is the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. That's in Acts 17.11. They're talking about that. So when you think about it, everything we have, all of our standards, even humanly standards, human laws, are based on what? Godly knowledge, godly standards. It says, which human conduct, creed, and religious opinion should be tried. So everything should be tried based on God's standards, what God expects. Not what humans expect, but what God expects. Fools mock, it says here in Proverbs 14, 9 and 14, it says, fools mock at making reparation. But there is good will among the upright. And in Proverbs 14, it says the disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves and a good one what his deeds deserve. Solomon contrasted fools who mock at making reparation with the upright. Reparation means to what? I looked it up and it said to make it like a repentance or to ask for like forgiveness or to make amends, make an atonement sort of. In one version of the Bible and the NIV that I have here, it's, it doesn't say reparation. It says fools mock at sin. I like that version because it says fools mock at sin. Worldly people mock at sin. They laugh at it. They laugh at you. They laugh at me. And they laugh at sin, too. Worldly people laugh at sin. They say, ah. They go on. They keep sinning. They laugh at it. They don't worry about it. And they keep on sinning. And it says, what happens? What happens if you do? But there is good will among the upright. And what is the upright? What is an upright? Who is an upright? The Hebrew word rendered making reparation can have different nuances of meaning, but the primary usage is as a designation for the guilt or trespasses offering, it says here. And it says the upright demonstrates a willingness to make a peace offering or to make reparation with others when needed. He referred to these postures of peace as goodwill. But if we walk in the way of the Lord, then we walk upright, don't we? So we're always making a goodwill gesture of the Lord, aren't we? We're showing ourselves to everyone that we are Christian, that we walk in the way of the Lord, that our hearts are open to him, and we're leaving our hearts open to everyone else to help them, not for ourselves, because we don't do it in vain. We do it in the name of the Lord. So what we do when we help someone, we help somebody in the name of the Lord. We help them to glorify the Lord. So you have to leave your heart open, not closed, because what you do, you do with your heart, not with your mind. Wisdom comes from the heart. It doesn't come from your mind. It comes from your heart because the Holy Spirit talks to you. It reaches down inside you. You get it from the Bible. You get it from trying to understand what is being said and what you're reading and opening your heart to the Bible opening your heart to the Lord, opening your heart to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit live in you so the Holy Spirit guides you, gives you wisdom, and you ask for help. You don't let your mind guide you. You let your heart guide you with the Holy Spirit. The upright just demonstrates a willingness to make peace. Then it goes on to say, making reparation recalls Old Testament law which was exceedingly clear regarding the need to make restitution for sin. For example, a man who cheated, stole, or lied had to make restitution to the individual who had been victimized by his sinful actions. Further, he had to present a guilt or a trespass offering to the priest. Do we need to do that anymore? Do we need to go out here and slaughter the nearest or the best looking sheep or goat? or cow, or dove. Think about how 
they ask for forgiveness and think about how you ask for forgiveness. It was easy for them. It's still as easy today. All they had to do was just go out and kill something and then they got forgiven. A lot of people think today, all you got to do is say, Lord, forgive me for my sin and you're done. But is that how you're forgiven? Is that how you're truly forgiven? If I say it, Lord, forgive me for my sin because I'm done. Does that sound like something that's come from within? Does that sound like something that's come from my heart? Does that sound like something that is being driven from within? No. It's not in the mind. It's in the heart. Wisdom comes from the heart. Wisely comes from the heart. Being wise comes from within. Being driven by the Holy Spirit. And you have to open yourself to that. You have to give yourself to the Lord. The contrast Solomon was making in verse 9 was actually the contrast between contentment and discontentment. Foolishness will lead to discontentment, but wise living leads to contentment. This was Paul's point in Philippians, where he spoke of being content in Christ. Paul insisted that contentment is something that can be learned and applied. Paul applied this contented knowledge of God in times when there was plenty and in times when we lacked even the basic necessities of life. Think about that. When you have everything you want, you're content. Everything you want is you, you are content. When you're happy, you're content. What do you do? Do you pray harder? Do you pray more? Do you open your heart more to the Lord? Or do you slow down? Do you fall away? Do you forget about God? Do you close your heart? Do you only open your heart when you have COVID-19? Or do you open your heart and ask for him and look for wisdom and wisely ask for what you need in his name and ask for what you should do? when there's something going on that you need help with? Or do you do it all the time in everything you do? Do you ask him, do you turn to him all the time? Not just when you're in desperate need, but even when you're the happiest of happy and you have everything you want, do you still turn to him? Or do you forget about him? because you have everything you want. You think, ah, I don't need anything. So there's no reason to talk to him now. In each and every circumstance, he had learned to be content in the person of Jesus. Contentment in him means that we can be content in our circumstances without being content with the circumstance. Paul was used of God to be an agent of change within the undesirable circumstance. So if you're asking for wisdom and wisely asking for what you need in life, you're asking for all of that at the same time in everything you do, whether you're happy in your situation or you're not happy in your situation. Because you should be happy for the Lord and you should be happy in your heart for God. Not because you don't have a car or you have a beautiful car, but because you have the Lord. That's where your happiness is. The Hebrew word translated disloyal one is related to the concept of backsliding. Well, that's a good one, right? Backsliding. How many people backslide? Nobody, right? We don't backslide ever. Not one person has ever backslide. It suggests someone who begins as a follower of the Lord and then turns back. It is a person who takes steps on the path of God's wisdom, but returns to a lifestyle guided by his own desires. He will get what his conduct deserves. On the other hand, a good one, a person who walks in God's wisdom, will get what his deeds deserve. So, don't none of you out there say that I've never backslided. Don't nobody say that I've never done anything wrong, because we know we all have. But what do you do when you figure out, wait a minute, I've done something wrong? Do you open your heart to the Lord and ask for help and going back to him? Or do you just keep going back and stay back and not asking for that help, not asking for that wisdom, 
that wisely wisdom from the Lord to say, hey, how do I get out of this situation? Help me. Walk with me. Be in my heart. Guide me. Give me everything I need to move forward, to come closer to you. Not to stay here where I'm at, but to be closer to you. This is similar to what Paul said about sowing and reaping. The apostle wrote that true contentment is not only found in God, but there is a deep sense of peace that comes from a clear conscience. A clear conscience comes from avoiding what is sinful and embracing what is righteous. When a person's conscience is clear, that person can be at peace with God. So if you don't have a clear conscience, can you have peace with God? Or are you still falling away from him? Are you still standing on the back or on the sidelines looking on the outside looking in? I mean, think about it. If you haven't asked for forgiveness and you don't ask for that guidance from him. And the reason I say ask for guidance and all that, because that's wisdom. That's showing wisdom. That's showing wise wisdom by asking him and talking to him and being with him. And asking him to be with you and everything you do. Otherwise, you're going to be the foolish one. So when it does come time in the end, are you going to be truly gone? Or are you going to be with him in heaven? Are you going to be standing there looking at everybody else up there? Or are you going to be somewhere else? Are you going to be not with him? Or are you going to be sharing with him? Because you didn't open your heart to him. You didn't accept him and accept what he has to give you. You didn't have the wisdom and you didn't think wisely and ask him for everything that you could get and everything that you could have, which is him, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the Lord, which is God, which is Jesus Christ, which is everything in your heart, everything you ever need. That ain't the car. It's not the gold. It's not the silver. It's not the money. It's not the fancy clothes. It's the Lord. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit living in you. A clear conscience from avoiding what is sinful and embracing what is righteous. When a person's conscience is clear, he can be at peace. God, in the other words, contentment not only comes from being right with God, but from being on the right side of wise decision making. Living out God's wisdom brings the true reward of lasting contentment. What is the true reward? Ponder on that. What is the true reward? Is it that million dollars on let's spend the will there on will of fortune? Or is it a lifetime of eternity with the Lord? And we go on here, it says, Joyful, Proverbs 14.10 and 14.13. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. In Proverbs 14.13, it says, Even in laughter, a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. So let's look at this. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. So whether you're bitter, does the outside share in that? No, the outside doesn't share in bitterness. The outside doesn't share in your heart at all unless you open your heart to the Lord and you present the Lord to everybody. Then everybody can share in that. Nobody wants to share in your bitterness. Nobody does that because the appearance can be deceived. No one really knows what another person is feeling in his or her heart. Do you know what's in somebody's heart? Solomon declared that the person who appears to be happy may actually be bitter, who also know that laughter is not to be confused with joy. The Hebrew word translated sad can also mean pain. A person's laughter can mask his pain. That's why Solomon noted that even in laughter a heart may be sad and joy may end in grief. I had a discussion one day downstairs with someone, and we had a discussion. And the discussion was, I know that person is a good Christian. And I said, how do you know? And they said, well, because I know their heart is good. I said, how do you know their heart is good? Because I see what they do and I know what they do. I said, but you don't know what's in their heart. Only the Lord knows what's in your heart. I can't tell what's in somebody's heart. Only God knows what's in your heart. There's a lot of people who are out there. 
there's a lot of evangelists. There's a lot of other people who are out there who will present a lot of things to you and say a lot of good things to you, but their heart is not where it should be. Only the Lord knows what's in your heart. And you know. Only you and the Lord know. My wife doesn't know what's in my heart, and I can't tell you what's in my wife's heart. I think I know, and I like to believe I know, but I don't. I can't read somebody's heart. I'm not God. The point I'm trying to make is don't perceive everything. Don't go on everything you see. Open your heart and let the Lord speak to you and go by what you know, exactly what you know and what the Bible tells you. Not with what somebody tells you or what you think you know because somebody else is there and what somebody else does because you never know what's in somebody's heart. So open your heart to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. Be wise in your decisions by asking the Holy Spirit to guide you in everything you do. It doesn't matter what I tell you. It doesn't matter what any other pastor tells you. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It matters what the Holy Spirit tells you and what the Bible says. That's the main thing. That's what matters. Because a lot of people can put on a mask, like it says here, a person's laughter can mask his pain. That's why Solomon noted that even in laughter, a heart may be sad and joy may end in grief. But Solomon, in all of his wisdom, think about this. He asked the Lord for wisdom because he didn't know what to do. He didn't think he could lead his people. They were the Lord's people, but the Lord gave him wisdom, gave him wisdom beyond anybody else, gave him wiseness, gave him everything he could ever imagine, gold, silver, all kinds of things. And what happened? Even with all of that, he lost sight of who? As believers, we don't need to wear masks to conceal our pain and grief. Pursuing godly wisdom results in joy, a genuine joy that comes from an intimate relationship with God. Such joy holds up under the trials of life. Consequently, as believers, we don't need to wear masks to conceal our pain and grief. Instead, we can count on the joy that comes in our walk with God to sustain us even when our hearts ache. Grief awaits all of us. But our joy in Christ will hold us up in the times of grief. How much grief did Jesus go through? Dying on the cross for us. Think about that. But did that stop him? No, that didn't stop him. How much grief do you think God goes through? Think about that. When he sees his people suffering because they won't come to him. Because they won't open their hearts to him. They won't walk in his way. How much grief does that cause him? I mean, he came to save the world for those who believe in him. But he gave himself up for us. He went through everything so that we could have everything. As long as we open our hearts to him and we think wisely and we ask him for that wise decision making, that wisdom that we need in everything we do, because without it, we're nothing. Without him, we are nothing. We own nothing. We have nothing. We are nothing. Absolutely nothing. The desire to be happy is common to all people, but how a person defines happiness makes all the difference in the world. Real lasting joy comes from knowing and doing the will of God. It comes from being in the center of God's purposes. For one's life, even when the purpose may take a person through the valley of the shadow of death, it says here, what if someone asked you about the joy that's abiding in your heart? How would you describe it? So if somebody asked you about the joy that's in you, how would you describe that? Proverbs 14, 11 through 12. Thriving. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Recall that in the section Solomon was using a literal device known as kismus. When writers employed this literary device, they wrote the main idea or point in the center of the passage instead of at the beginning or the end. 
The verses before and after the center point help to develop it. The main point of this section in Proverbs, therefore, is in verse 11 through 12. Solomon pronounced judgment on those who ignore God's wisdom and blessing on those who follow God's wisdom. Well, let's look at this. It says here, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Think about that. It says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish house. So the wicked people have a house. It could be anything. It could be a mansion. It could be a wood house, a brick house, but they have a house, but they're wicked. So they must have money or they must have something. They must have some type of means, but it says it will be destroyed. They're going to lose it. They're going to lose everything. And then it goes on to say, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Tent. Here you have people who believe in him, who are walking in his way, who open their heart to him, who ask him for wisdom and ask him for everything, are living in a tent. But they're going to flourish. But does that mean you're going to flourish here on earth? No. Not necessarily. God doesn't say he's going to give you gold and silver. But what he does say he will give you is eternal life with him. He will give you everlasting life with him. He will give you that. And that is worth more than anything else you can ever imagine. Think about that. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Hmm. So if you're not asking him for guidance and you go on your own, then you might be taking the wrong path is what he's trying to say here, right? Is that what they're trying to say? Let's take a look here. It says in verse 11, let's see, verse 12. Again, in verse 12, Solomon makes a contrast. Godly wisdom and joy do not always line up with what the world thinks is wise or what how the world thinks true happiness is obtained. Some people depend on their own ingenuity or shrewdness to guide them as they choose the way they want to live. They make decisions only on the basis of their opinions, ambitions, or prejudices. They ponder the options before them and make a decision that seems to them to be the right one. Then they set out on the path that seems to make sense to them. But when they set out on a path without being wise in the Lord, they may end up where they did not intend to go without the wisdom that comes from God. And they will not have the wisdom they need to make the best choices with their lives. So how many people in the world wake up in the morning and decide, I am going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm doing this. And how many people wake up in the morning and say, Thank you, God, for giving me the ability to do this and that. And what should I do? Should I do this or should I do that? Help me, guide me, show me the way. Show me what I should do. Help me along my way. Help me make my decisions. What do you do? I don't always ask him for help like I should. I know I don't. I try to, but then I backslide a little bit there, and I don't always. But should I? Yeah, I should. Sometimes when I'm talking... I don't give him his just due because he's the one that gives me the ability to do what I do. And sometimes I say, I did this or I do that when I shouldn't. And I catch myself and I'll say, the Lord allowed me to do this or he gave me the ability to do this. Do we give the Lord his glory by asking him for his help, by being wise in what we do and ask him, or do we shut him out? and think that we can do it on our own. What matters most in knowing and doing the will of God? At times, following God's will leads to days of peaceful tranquility. At other times, knowing and doing the will of God can lead to great sacrifice and difficulty. But what matters is knowing that doing what is right by the Lord as revealed in His Word, not by what we think is right. You know, I got a friend and I talked to him and he says, I believe in God. And I tell him, well, that's great. I'm glad you do. And I says, do you open your heart to him? And did you ask him to come in? And he says, well, I believe in him. And I believe in this. And I believe in that. And he says, and I'm a good person. I says, you are. And he says, yeah, I'm always doing everything good for people. I says, well, that's great. But do you do it because why? Well, I'm a good person. But why do you do it? 
because the Lord guides you to do it? Do you do it in the name of the Lord? Or do you do it because you think it's just the right thing to do? And he says, oh, you get me every time, don't you? Every time I think I'm doing something, you always find something to get me. And I said, no, I'm not trying to get you. I'm trying to get you to understand that what you do isn't a matter of just doing it. It's how you do it. And whether you do it with God or without God, whether you ask him for the wisdom and the guidance to do it and how to do it, or you just do it on your own. If you do it on your own, you're not giving the glory to him. You're taking the glory. If you do it with him and you ask him for the guidance, the wisdom, that's being wise. That's giving him the glory. And that's opening your heart to him. And that's letting him work through you to do right. And that's what you need to do. And that's what this is about. That's what reading the Bible is about. Opening your heart to the Lord. Opening your heart to him. Coming to him. Asking him. Being one with him. Walking in his way. It says here, the wise person seeks to understand knowledge. And where do you find the knowledge? How do you understand the knowledge? By the Holy Bible by reading the scriptures, by reading everything in here, some way or another, it doesn't matter what year it is, it doesn't matter what continent you're on, it doesn't matter where you are in the world or where you come from, this can apply. Following God's wisdom leads to contentment. And it does. Whether you get what you think you should have, or what God gives you, what knows what you should have and gives you what you should have, in the end, you will be content. You will be happy with what you get. Unless you're just a worldly person and you won't be happy unless you have that gold and silver. And at that point, you better get on your hands and knees at that point. God's wisdom produces joy even when there is grief. If he's in your heart, you will find the joy. And the joy is in him not in what's here on earth, but in him. And God's wisdom leads to his blessings. And how do you get his blessings? By doing his will and asking him. And he will give you his blessings. He will help you. Unless you turn away from him and you don't do his will. Unless you do what you say you think is his will. Unless you sit there and say, I thought he told me to buy that new car or that house, but maybe he didn't. Maybe it was something else telling me. The point is, of all of this is, even Solomon and all of his knowledge, wisdom, everything he had, he had trouble because he didn't keep his eye on the Lord. He didn't keep his heart open to the Lord. He didn't have his eye on the Lord. But he didn't have something we have, too. We have everything about the Lord right here. We have a book, the Bible, that can guide us. He didn't have this yet. He wrote this. He wrote part of it to help us that we can read that will help us and will guide us. We have him because now he died on the cross and he sent the Holy Spirit to us to live within us that it will guide us and live in us and teach us and help us and help open our hearts so we can understand what we read. And they didn't have everything in that we have like that but we have these tools to help us we have the holy spirit we have god we have jesus we have everything we need all we have to do is have the wisdom and be wise about what we do and open our hearts to what we do and use them let's close please dear lord i thank you for allowing me to come here and speak i pray that i do some good for somebody, at least one person. I ask that somebody opens their heart to what I said, understands it. I ask that you reach out and help those that are sick and needy. There's a lot of people hurting. I know quite a few people that are hurting and have troubles in the hospital. And I know that there's a lot of people right now who are worried about the disease and coronavirus and everything going on in this world. But if we set our sights on you, we have nothing to worry about. One way or another, you'll protect us in whatever your decisions are. We know that your decisions are true 
and only the best for us. And we place all of our prayers and every and all of our needs and all of our wants in your hands. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>